Welcome back. So before I start talking about the Fourier transform and the Fourier series, I want to remind you a little bit about uh, inner products of functions. Okay, so we're really familiar with vector spaces, uh, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, n-dimensional vectors uh, of coordinates or of data. But now we're going to be talking about inner products of functions. And what I want to do here, this is pretty confusing the first time you see it uh, for some people. And so what I want to do is convince you that the definition of an inner product of functions is uh, kind of very consistent with our definition of inner products of vectors. Okay, so I'm going to do this uh, with an example where we're going to take some functions of x, so this is my x direction, and we're going to have some function f and some function g. And what we're going to do is we're going to define the inner product between these two functions. Okay, so I'm going to define my inner product of f of x with g of x as the integral, and let's say that this is defined on some domain uh, from a to b. And then this is going to be defined as the integral from a to b of f of x times g of x dx. Okay. Now, if uh, this was a complex valued function, which we're going to use later on, like if this was some e to the i uh, omega x or something like that, then this inner product would have a complex conjugate over this g. So this would be f of x times complex conjugate of g of x. But for real valued data, for real valued functions f and g, the complex conjugate of g is just g. So you can kind of forget that. So don't worry about that right now. Okay, so this is how we define the inner product of two functions. Uh, this essentially tells me how similar these two functions are, just like the inner product of vectors tells me, you know, if, if my two vectors are, are, are orthogonal, then my inner product is zero. If they're very well aligned, I have a large inner product. It's exactly the same thing with these functions. So the two that I drew here are actually very close to each other, so they should have a large inner product when I multiply them and integrate uh, from A to B. Okay, but what I want to show you now is that if we discretize these functions at a discrete set of, of x locations and we collect data vectors of the function evaluated at those positions, then this inner product essentially comes from that, that inner product of, uh, of sampling. So I'm going to do that right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to sample this function f at a bunch of discrete locations uh, f1, f2, f3, and so on and so forth, all the way up to fn. So I'm going to have n samples of this function. I'm going to do the same thing with g. So g1, g2, g3, uh, and so on and so forth, all the way up to gn. And I'm going to be sampling these at regular intervals, x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot all the way up to xn, okay? And so I'm going to, for now, just assume that there's a constant delta x that I'm using uh, to sample between, uh, between these points, okay? So I think I would have something like uh, delta x is equal to b minus a divided by n minus one, something like that, okay? So as I increase n, or as I decrease delta x, I increase the number of sample points n that I have, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna think about the inner product of data vectors containing these sampled points f and these sampled points g, and I'm gonna show you that as you take the limit, as delta x goes to zero, as this becomes infinitely finely resolved, as you recover these functions, then you recover this, uh, this function definition of an inner product, okay? So let's do that. So my f function is, I'm just gonna put an underbar to denote that this is kind of a, a vector of data like we're used to seeing, an n-dimensional vector, containing f1, f2, dot, 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 all the way down to fn. And similarly, I'm going to have g underbar is g1, g2 dot 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 all the way down to g n. Good. Now it's relatively straightforward to take the inner product of these uh, vectors. We know exactly how to do that. We have lots of intuition for how to, how to compute the inner product of these two vectors. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is that when you do that and then you take n goes to infinity or delta x goes to zero, you recover this exactly. Okay, so let's do that right now. Uh, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take the inner product of vector f with vector g, kind of my data vectors here. And we know that this is going to be, um, I'm going to just define this as g transpose f. So what that essentially means is I take g, I knock it over on its side. So let me draw a picture. It looks like g as a row vector times f as a column vector. Okay. And what that means is that I take the first element of f1 times the first element of g1 plus the second element of f2 plus the second element g2 uh, plus f3, g3 plus f4, g4, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a sum from k equals 1 to n of f, k, g, k. And again, if this was complex value data, this would be g bar, and this would be complex conjugate transpose. Uh, I'm just going to neglect that for now, but I want you to remember that if this was complex data, this would be complex conjugate transpose, and this would be uh, a complex conjugate on all of these little g's. Okay. Now, there's a little bit of an issue here, um, as, as far as I see it, which is if I double the number of data points, if I have 2n data points instead of just n, this gets twice as large because I'm adding up twice as many things. So that's a little strange. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to normalize this by delta x which is going to make it so that if I double the resolution, this number doesn't get twice as big just because I have twice as many data points, okay? So if I look at my f, g uh, on my data vectors times delta x, now what I have is this equals my sum from k equals 1 to n of uh, f of k, g, k times delta x. Now what I'm going to say here is that f, k, we know that fk is just f evaluated at xk. So I'm going to say that this is f at xk, g at xk, times delta x. And so this is where uh, kind of it all comes together. If I, this is just the Riemann approximation of my continuous integral up here. Remember, if this was complex value data, these would have bars, bars, this would be a complex conjugate transpose. And so if I take the limit as delta x goes to zero, so I have infinitely fine resolution, this vector becomes infinitely tall and it contains the whole function from a to b, then this uh, Riemann approximation becomes my continuous integral formulation, okay? So I just wanted to show you that this definition of the inner product for functions, again, it, it tells you exactly the same information that the inner product of vectors tells you. It tells you how close these two functions, f and g, are to each other, how aligned are they in function space. But there's nothing kind of magical happening here. This is just what you would get if you took the inner product of vectors of data as the resolution of that data became infinitely finely resolved. Okay, so I think that's really nice to kind of convince you that nothing fancy is happening here. We're going to use these function inner products a lot in Fourier series to represent arbitrary functions with sines and cosines. All right, thank you.